Bonjour et bienvenue à tous et à toutes. Je m'appelle Cynthia Hammond et je suis directrice du Centre d'histoire orale et de récits numérisés à l'Université Concordia et aussi professeure en histoire de l'art à la même institution. And I want to begin this conversation today with the wonderful artist François Morelli by acknowledging that the land upon which this event takes place is unceded indigenous territory. The Kanyangahaka Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters we now call Montreal, historically a gathering place for many First Nations. I also want to thank our other hosts, Nusetson Laposte and Isabelle de Mévius, who have organized an exceptional exhibition that spans Francois's earliest work to some of his most recent drawing, sculpture, and performance. And if this is your first time visiting this exhibition, I implore you to take the time to visit all three floors of this gorgeous show, and also to watch the excellent film about Francois that was made by Suzanne Guy. It's being screened, uh, I think, every hour uh, in the basement. And I think you're also going to want to pick up a copy, if you can just pick it up, <laughs> of the gorgeous publication that accompanies this exhibition, in part for its sheer gorgeousness. I wish I had a copy of it in my hands right now. It's so beautiful. But also because it has two very perceptive and thorough catalog essays by my esteemed colleagues Bernard Lamarche and Jake Moore. So uh, I'm here obviously today with Francois Morelli, who has been teaching in the Department of Fine Arts, Studio Arts at Concordia for, I'd say, what is it now? 20, 20 years this year. 20 years this year, and he's still smiling. <laughs> but he is also the focal artist in this retrospective exhibition at La Poste, which represents, he told me, I think it was about 10% of your overall... Well, that was a, a, a low, <laughs> low balling of it, probably 5% of what I have in archives, but that's the case for many artists who manage to live beyond 60 and 70 years old, so that's, I think, the case. So it's a very selective retrospective of an enormous and very rich body of work. And uh, if uh, you already know Francois, then you know that he is uh, esteemed by his community in the world of drawing, performance, sculpture. But he also has many, many linkages in his work between choreography, dance, musical notation, cartography. And I hope we're going to get into some of these fascinating connections today. So if anyone here has already read the essays in the catalog uh, that accompanies this show, you will know that Francois's work has had many uh, exceptional interlocutors over the years, including Claire Gravel, Pierre Huyer, and John K. Grandy, just to name a few. So I thought it might be interesting, Francois, for us to start uh, with a story as to how it has come to be that you and I are sitting here today. So I'll, uh, can I introduce you yes. now? Because yes. you've introduced me and I can introduce you. Um, Many years ago, in 1996, I was invited to have an exhibition at the Ellen Gallery by the then director, Karen Antaki. At the time, I was teaching at Trois-Rivières, which was the university I was tenured at. And I had a fairly large exhibition of sculptures, primarily at, uh, at the Ellen Gallery. And um, during that exhibition, and shortly afterwards, uh, a paper was published in Parachute, an article was published by the young girl who was working at the desk, who I didn't know at the time. And that young PhD student who was at the desk working was Cynthia Hammond, who was working on her PhD. Um, we had met a little bit because basically I was in and out, but I was spending more time in Trois-Rivières than other. And then the following year, I applied for a job at Concordia and began to teach at Concordia that next fall at which point I definitely got to know Cynthia Hammond because she was the colleague of a very dear friend, Suzanne Leblanc, who was also a PhD scholar in the, uh, I think it was the SIP program or the humanities, humanities program at the time. So at that time, Cynthia and I met and she was a young uh, still, uh, PhD candidate and scholar and then she disappeared and I didn't know where she went. 
And then she reappeared several years later, and she reappeared as a full-fledged professor in the art history department. And in between that, I would be working with my colleagues, Catherine McKenzie, Lauren Lerner, various other, Sandra Pukowski, and they'd be talking about this brilliant student that they had who had gone off to England who was working there on her postdoc, and uh, this writer, and it was uh, Cynthia Hammond. And when she did return as an art historian, we began to work together as colleagues in the same faculty. And um, yes, it's been 20 years, and the irony is this is the last year that I'll be teaching at Concordia because my retirement begins in 2019, uh, 2018. And the last three years have been spectacular. Spectacular because I've had the opportunity of teaching a new class called Drawing from Sights and Actions at the undergrad level. And it's a class that I was able to design with Cynthia Hammond. In other words, Cynthia and I have been working on an undergraduate advanced drawing class which merges installation, performance, and our two fields of interest spread over two semesters. And I teach one semester and Cynthia picks them up and teaches the second semester. And sometimes it's me before her or her after me. But the last two years have been really wonderful. And I've said it several times and I'll repeat it today, the best experience of 38 years of teaching at the university level. So largely because it's a field that I'm interested in and I finally feel like I'm doing what I wanted to do. Secondly, because it is truly interdisciplinary because both our practices are interdisciplinaries as practicing artists and in individuals interested in history and theory and that we actually bridge art history and studio arts in a way that has rarely been done in the Faculty of Fine Arts. And I wish, and I came to Concordia 20 years ago thinking this is what would happen more often and it's happened this time, so we'll leave it at that. <laughs> so it's very fitting for me to right now be sitting here with Cynthia and be able to uh, converse and, and answer questions that she'll ask for me. A great mutual pleasure. And we're also thrilled to see some of the students from that class here today as well. It's so nice that you're, you've come. So I want to actually go back to a point in time when Francois and I did not know each other. Uh, and I would like to ask you, Francois, to tell us a story, if you will, about the first performance. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting place to begin because um, it, it's so essentialist in a way as a question. <laughs> so the idea story. of what is the first performance, and, and I think it comes about in our last conversation together, Cynthia and I, and it's, uh, it wasn't an official performance. It really was... Uh, if you have to imagine a household in a four and a half flat in Oshlaga on the Cuvillier Street in the East End of Montreal, circa 1970, 69. And I don't even think I'm in art school yet. And uh, my brother is probably still studying at Sir George Williams or he's a hippie traveling around. And my dad's at the table with my mom and I and we're having supper and all of a sudden my mom screams. And I don't know why she screams and I look up and there's my father standing in the middle of the very small kitchen with a brown paper bag over his entire body. He's decided to take a shopping bag from probably Steinberg's or Dominion's with nothing really written on it, and he's draped it over his body, and he's just standing there immobile in the kitchen. And my brother and I look at each other, and we look at my mother, and she screams, and I say, Tommy, what the hell are you doing? And he then just takes it off and sheepishly sits down and says, let's have supper. And it was the kind of gesture and action that really just cut through what the day-to-day -day household would have been and what the normal ritual of sitting down for supper together would have been. And this man who had devoted his life to being a clerk for Canada Cement in the East End, who had an education of a grade three, who probably never knew what performance art was or could be, but who was a born performer, who loved to sing and dance, and who did uh, pretty much karaoke before it was karaoke with his family because he would impersonate stars during parties. But he was also the man who had tried to apprentice with a painter in 1930s in Old Montreal as the eldest of an Italian family. And he was also the man who went to L'Ecole du Meb for a whole month long enough to create a T-square and get the protractor and compass and all to learn to draft and draw. But all of that was really quickly cut with being the eldest of eight children and being the person who had to come back home and, and take care of his brothers and sisters. 
So that's the first performance. It's the first performance of him performing in the household, and it's also the first performance in the sense of the man who probably could have been the artist as a second generation immigrant Italian, who basically really ended up going to grade three and then really became the father of two sons and uh, took every opportunity he could to subvert any sense of normalcy, whether in the household, whether in a party environment, or whether on the street, who would basically always play games and enjoy the total subversive nature of ludic play in society. I think one of the... Uh, and you know what I'm going to do now, because okay. Cynthia asked me that and I had to do it. <laughs> so is... I'm going to pass around a picture of that photograph. So my yeah. mother at some point said, Flora, go get the camera. So you see the shape of the photograph. It's one of those brownie instamatics, which was the only carry you have. And I printed it in five copies, so I thought I'd circulate it. So pass it around. Look at it. And that's Dominic Morelli performing in the uh, kitchen on Cuvillier Street, what I would call the first performance. So there's three things that I find amazing about this photograph, maybe four. First, you have it still. Oh, yeah, <laughs> That's I how kept important it. this photograph is. Number two, that your dad did that in the first place. You know, what a sense of space and timing to have done that with the most banal of objects as well. He saw this big bag, he recognized that he could fit himself into it, he recognized that he could destabilize that moment, which was such an ordinary daily moment of getting ready for dinner. He could freak your mother out, perhaps annoy her a little bit too, totally. uh, get a reaction from the, the kids, but it was also your mother who said, get the camera. Yeah. So I feel as though in that moment, much, <laughs> not to create a, a false mythology around you, but I feel that much was born in that moment where you recognized what it is to capture space, time, and attention, but also how important it is to document it so that that can be communicated later. The documentation, I really had no sense of what it meant. You just wanted to get the camera and really you were looking at, this is not the ubiquity of a cell phone and the digital image. This is really 12 images on a brownie instamatic and there's gotta be very, and basically if you go see the film downstairs, I had to go through the archives of the family and we weren't the type of family to have super eight films and all that. There was, there was a rarity of images. So she understood that and recognized it. And I think her role was very much of one to be able to recognize things and see those things and photograph uh, the characters in her family acting out. Mm -hmm. And believe me, we all acted out in different ways. So she was able to recognize it. And, it, and it, the fact that it still stayed there, she kept it amongst a lot of the possessions that then we had to call through as the passing of her life and his life and then my brother's life where then we, I became the custodian of these images. And uh, I think it's a couple of years ago I thought, does that photograph still exist? So I went to this archive of family photographs and there it was as that image. And then when you asked me this morning, do you still have the photograph? I said, yeah, I knew where it was, I got it. and I thought the best thing to do today would be to pass it around so that object would literally be moving around the space and people would be manipulating it. It was the one thing I thought might be missing from for, the show. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> just so photograph. as an anecdotal kind of bridge for that, we've got a couple of students who are doing uh, drawing from sites and actions and I think the third workshop is the brown paper bag workshop mm -hmm. where I literally come into class and bring in a garden bag from Rona that has no writing on it. I give each student a brown paper bag and I ask them to explore it and excuse the vocabulary, all shit breaks loose because the workshop then lasts for about an hour and a half non-stop. All that's fueling it is Terry Riley, a piece of music that goes on for an hour and a half and they explore space inside, outside, the body, architecture. And if I'm right, Margot, correct me, one student crawled into the bag and stayed in there for a solid 48 minutes, moving ever so slowly and exploring space. And by the end of it, they're shattered and trashed and cut into pieces and the bag just exists. So that's the, the first workshop before students really begin to understand that they are in representation and now they are, are, they are all performing for the first time, most of them actually. So, so this is one of the things that I actually really love about talking with Francois. It's that how something that happened almost, well, let's say, 45 years ago can cycle back into his practice either through teaching or through creation uh, and have a, still an, an amazing charge, amazing resonance. Uh, and I want to just stay with uh, your family in a way for another few questions because it seems to me that family history and family stories are really tied 
through place to your life and your work. So there's lots of stories of migration, limits, passages, gains and losses. And these are not only material, but sometimes also ephemeral, so the loss of language or the gaining of language, for example. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit to the room about the role of Achelaga Maisonneuve in your early imaginings of yourself and space and identity as a way of talking about some of the work that came out of that. The, the immigrant family that arrived from Sicily in, I believe it was about 1900, 1905, literally Im immigrated to Ashlaga Maisonneuve on Ontario Street. And today when people think Ashlaga, they think hardcore Quebecois, ancestral, and, they, and then I say, no, it's like the Park X of the, of the 1920s. It was cosmopolitan. My memory of Oshlega was walking the streets with my Sicilian grandfather, who spoke only Italian, and going to the local grocer who sold cigars the same way he bought in Palermo, which were dried on a string, and he could buy them there. So there was this memory of a very cosmopolitan city uh, street of Oshlega, where my mother was born on Moro, which is the beginning of uh, Ontario in Oshlega, and it runs to Vio. And along that street was the history of both my maternal and paternal family. And my uncles lived on that street and reigned the roost as the manager of the pool hall or the manager of the clubs locally and what was on. And I grew up, I was born on, Oshlaga, on, on, on the Ontario and Morgan Boulevard in front of the market. So went to school, hung out, teenage life, parents' life, married, were married. and. Saint Regret, where, where the infamous Guido Molinari was, where the funeral was in terms of Nativity de Schlager, uh, was where we, we spent our entire lives in terms of being raised as Anglo Franco Italian immigrants, first, second, and third generation. And within that, you have the hierarchy of, the, of Ashlaga, which is the hill, below the hill, above the hill, in the hill, the train track, and below the train track. And that's the socioeconomics of Ashlaga. Is basically you start at the river and you work your way up to Rachel. And if you came from above the hill, which was the Morellis, you were prosperous and you did well in your life. But if you came from below the tracks, which were the Marquetas, you were poor and destitute in terms of where you came from. And in, my mother's upward mobility was to move from Ontario Street to Sherbrooke Street, which was just that hill in that. And that's, that, those were the political and social dynamics of the economics of Ashlega. So, and then later on as a teenager, when I went down the hill, because I was finally allowed to move and be alone and leave the backyard and the lanes of above the hill, I ended up meeting the true life of what Quebecois culture was, which were my friends that I met there who basically, I had gone to English schools. If you can imagine an Irish Jesuit school on the corner of Pinaf and um, Adam Street, and that's where I went to school. But my teenage life was going to Ontario Street and hanging out with my friends where I discovered Baudelaire, Rimbaud, Charlebois, L'Autriamont, Cinema Indépendant, uh, the whole counterculture of the 60s. So it was this fusion now of this Anglo education as a grade school and high school, and then this identity of a Quebecois identity that I grew up with because it was the shared economics of coming from that lower part of that city. Mm -hmm. And then discovering the teenage life that I went there. And then it was Expo. It was the summer of Expo. And then just exploding with the 60s and the early 70s. So it was a very dynamic life of Ashlega that the family was mapped out in terms of the maternal and paternal. And then my own history from very early childhood of back lanes and understanding Quebecois and the history through and post Revolution Tranquille all the way to um, the Mouvement Souverainiste, and then right into the 70s, 80s, 90s, until this day, because lo and behold, my studio is still there. For some reason, I bought a studio in the early 80s in the first Polish church of Montreal, where my mothers went to see silent movies in 1933 during the Depression. So it's, this continuity is there, but there was no way that I would know that I would end up buying a studio there. So it's a life that I go back to every day. I go to the studio and walk the streets and hang out there. Which is... It's like we planned this. It's a perfect segue <laughs> to uh, what I want to ask you about next, which is actually a fairly recent work called La Maison. So it really struck me from various conversations that we've had that 
uh, Ontario Street was one of the first lines that you began to work with as a, as a young person, understanding it as a, as a limit and a threshold between different parts of Oshlaga Mezunev, a class line, in some ways a gendered line because of your parents coming on either side, uh, linguistic for sure. Uh, and then, uh, I believe it was 2013 to 2014, you began the La Mesure piece, which is uh, an amazing durational performance work, also a drawing work, in which you take a yardstick ruler that your parents bought from a hardware store in Oshilaga Mezunov in the 1950s and painstakingly measure each yard between Moreau and Vio and marking the length. I don't actually know what you marked the length with. Was it a Sharpie? Sharpie. It's a sharp, several Sharpies in the sense because the sidewalk is wearing it down. Yeah, so uh, Ontario Street is being the street that as a teenager we would walk from one end to the other just to kill time. You went down, you had coffee, and then you walked the street, and you met people, and it was the street that we went down also as, as children, as, as children to, with my grandparents, and I mentioned that earlier. Um, I think I was on a jury, and forget which thesis defense it was, because there's been many, and the external was Mélanie Boucher, who now teaches at Université d'Ottawa, and she was a graduate student. Uh, she was my undergrad student, so I was meeting my old undergraduate student, and we're talking during the thesis defense. And she mentions that she's living in Nochlega and that her husband was a, a, a Grégoire. And I said, oh, Grégoire, is he related to the hardware store? She says, yeah, he is. And I said, oh, that's amazing. I said, she says, you know the hardware store? I said, yeah, we actually have a yardstick uh, that, that from the family, because I remember taking care of my parents' possessions and left, and I had, I had kept it. And I said, shit, you know, I'll give it to you, and you can give it to your husband. He'll be super happy to have this artifact from the family. So I went home, and I went to bed and I woke up in the middle of the next morning and I had told Diane, my partner, my wife, that, that this story. And I woke up the next morning telling Diane, I can't give her the, the yardstick. And she said, why? I said, I have to measure the street before I give her the yardstick. And over the night I had thought that this yardstick should be used to measure the space between Moro and Vio. And that I would basically just, on hands and knees, measure it. And in that action, engage with people in the same way that I engaged historically with all the walking pieces I had done and have conversations with people. So I began in that summer and I did the first ones and the first time I went out was just with the yardstick and a felt marker and, and a, a little sketchbook and I started measuring it. By the second time I had knee pads and gloves and by the third time I had a little skateboard that I made for myself and by the fifth time I had a a tripod hooked on to the skateboard that I was filming video and by the next summer I was producing videos and conversations and the action basically consists of people stopping me saying what are you doing and I tell them I'm measuring Ontario Street and they say why I said well basically I've got memories and histories and wherever I am on the street I said yeah my uncle used to work at the pool hall upstairs or I hung out at that restaurant or I, my parents were buried at that church or I was born on that street and then they immediately click in and they say oh yeah really I know that space how long have you been here oh I immigrated here back in the 30s or I've been here for 40 years my parents came here and then we engage in a conversation and I let the conversation go wherever it goes there's no documentation of it, there's no story at the end. I just remember one or two sentences and I write it down in the sketchbook that I met this man who told me this story about this and we actually then, and I let the person end the conversation and then I just move on and continue doing it. And I do it for two hours or three hours. I do it in the summertime. For two summers I couldn't because the city was ripping out all the sidewalks and there was no way of doing it. And at this point I'm past Chambly and I've still got a, a fair amount to do. And when the film came up that Suzanne Guy produced downstairs, she said, would you do a performance for us? And I said, well, I'll do two pieces. I'll do one, which is La Mesure. I'll do the extract and I'll cheat. I'll jump the thing to get to the, the Maison of Market. So there's a sequence there where I'm measuring Ontario Street in front of the Maison of Market, which is right across the street where I was born. And it's also the street in the market where there's a scene where I am leading my dog or my dog is leading me because we have a, a leash on each other. And that's the earliest memory I have of going to that market when I must be three because I come face to face with a goat at the time before 
Jean Drapeau banned the selling of animals in markets, and I remember facing up with a goat, and so I did that piece in that, in that market space there. So yeah, the La Mesure is now a full-fledged small skateboard with a slot for the yardstick. Tripod had felt marking notes on it of the different durations and a few excerpts of video, and it's now part of the film downstairs. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that... Um you know, that sort of very layered engagement with place through line that is also performance. It's a very strong theme in the early work that you did when you were a student at Concordia. So Francois has not only taught at Concordia, a very rich career, he also had, I think, quite a spectacular <laughs> time at Concordia when he did his BFA, which you finished in 1975, I think. So I'm thinking about your pigeon paintings your word maps, and your walking canvases, which, although they come much earlier than La Mesure in terms of the chronology of your life, I think they're a very strong link. So I wonder if you talk a little bit about those. So I do my bachelor's degree between 1973 and 73 and 75, 72 and 75. And um, I have, um, I basically identified all the drawing teachers I'm gonna work with, and I'm sort of really selecting my painting teachers. And I've had two years at Dawson prior to that. And um, just to make a short story, I am very aware of other tendencies going on in the art world. And I'm not finding the kind of support that I'm needing in terms of teachers around me, other than Irene Watom, who's a person that I'm working closely with. Uh, in other words, I'm tired of just going to class and doing mimetic drawings of the model, which was largely what drawing was about and painting flat colors with rollers, which is largely what my painting class was about, or spraying with a large gun and making large abstract paintings. And I begin to want to work with the space in between, the space in between my house, where my parents and I lived, and the school, which is downtown Montreal. Three pieces you mentioned. The first one um, would be, I'll, I'll start with the mapping of the space between Oshlaga and downtown, I wrap two canvases, one around my left foot, one around my right foot, and I walk, and I have a friend follow me and photograph me, and by the time I arrive at school, I stretch them, and I hang them and present them as landscapes. And it's, it's not a revolutionary gesture, because basically I, I knew of Francois Sullivan's work, Bill Vazan's work, and other people like Richard Long's work, so I'm just inscribing myself in the conceptual history of mapping spaces. But I am discovering things that are happening, which is all of the intersections with people asking me why I'm doing this and what it is. So I'm discovering a new side to it. Uh, I'm really trying to examine painting at the time. So the other thing I do is I have these white canvases that I bring out to de Maisonneuve and Guy, where the Batoon statue is. And the nice inheritance of that space and that square is the pigeons, because they've been there forever. They've literally been there for 45 years, and I'm sure it's the same breed of pigeons that keep on coming back. And I lay the canvases down, and I use grain, and I feed the pigeons, and they land and fly off and land and fly off and basically stain the canvases with pigeon shit. And I do 72 photographs of them flying off and landing and flying off and landing. And it's my first exhibition in 1976 in Ottawa, which is called Pigeon, which is a, a play on word, pigeons or choose. And it's the 72 photographs with the two canvases laid on. I showed it in Ottawa in a gallery there. And the third piece you're referring to are word maps, where I create maps of this, using the streets of the city of Montreal, and I write words with them. So as if they're trajectories, I write the word arbre that begins on Saint Laurent, starts at Notre Dame, goes up to Rachel, goes along, back down, and that's the A, and then the R, and the B, and the RE, all the way till I get to Georges V in the East End, where my dad worked. So I write the word out as these word maps to be walked and thought out and experienced. The anecdote to that is when I read um, uh, City of Glass by Paul Astaire, uh, and it's his trilogy, which is written in the late 70s, he writes a detective story around which the detective is following someone and he realizes that the person he's following is communicating with him, writing letters by the path he's writing in the grid of New York City. Mm. And he breaks the text page to create a drawing of a letter 
And I have goosebumps when I read the thing. Like, oh, yeah, I did that five years before Ostad wrote the novel. And then anyone knows about Ostad. He was working closely with conceptual artists at the time uh, in New York. And he and his partner, uh, Shiri Hisvat, are both really interested in visual arts and conceptual art in terms of that. So those are the three pieces you're describing, which were attempts to try and articulate my relationship to painting in a new way in the face of not wanting to just continue making paintings mm -hmm. and arrive at a kind of conceptual strategy. And that's something I think that is so strong in your work and it's really hard to sum up in a brief conversation. But uh, one of the things that I find so impressive about it is that there is a deep dialogue in your practice across disciplines, sculpture, printmaking, drawing, performance, dance, you're interested and use the modes of cartography, musical notation, seriality, reciprocity, even hospitality. You know, there's so many pieces we could talk about. I'm not even sure which one to ask you to speak of, but I, am, I would like to bring out in this context how intersections and the transitions between disciplines, ideas, tools, people, how that's really important to you. I know it was a big part of your work, uh, remains a big part of your work, which takes you from one distant place to another distant place. Your performance that started in Berlin and ended in Philadelphia, for example, but many others besides. Can you talk about transitions and intersections for you? Perhaps it's part of the conceptualist training and post-conceptualist training you had. I think it is part of the post-conceptual and I think it is part of the heritage of the 60s. I think it was the heritage that sort of took form in the late 50s and early 60s and at the time would have been uh, consolidating in popular culture in Expo. So whether it was called um, multidisciplinary at the time, which then became interdisciplinary, that then became transdisciplinary, and now we're referring to as intradisciplinary. So that idea of moving through across or in between disciplines was something very early on. And in the end, uh, I really felt that it was a key to uh, learning and thinking and it was the key that made me go to Rutgers University for a master's degree and not go to a largely art defined college and at Rutgers I was hoping to find a more social science humanities based program that I could discover and lo and behold I arrived at a place where Fluxus had been establishing a base and artists and teachers were involved with this similar kind of intra or interdisciplinary kind of approach to art. It was what I was hoping university would be and thought should be and could be because of faculties and the hybrids that were there. But unfortunately, having moved through many universities, I've realized that the verticality of universities are difficult to break down and it's not always possible to have that kind of interconnection. The movement across spaces and across disciplines is really that space in between, and people have talked about inter interstitial spaces and the idea of inter intersections and interstitial relationships in the drawings and in the mappings. And I really do think that that space in between home and school or that space between myself and you or your own home and where you're going or when you're crossing or you're meeting on a street, someone has gone from somewhere to somewhere else and I'm going from somewhere to somewhere else, and that intersection happens to be the here and now of we meet at that point. And I think the way I'm articulating it now is 40 years of doing it, and understanding that when you start multiplying those intersections, invariably you come up with a web. And these performances were, in the sense, moving through space and intersecting with people, and realizing that all these intersections were, in a sense, mapping out social space and geographic space, in a sense, psychic space as much as possible, to that then relate to, at least in my experience, in terms of cumulatively what it was doing, at the end of a day of carrying a sculpture, whether from Berlin to Philadelphia or from Saint -Jean -Port -Jean, New York to Saint Jean Port Joli or through North Africa, it was about these intersections with people. And it was what the relational or intersubjective spaces were potentially creating in the public space. I hadn't theorized all that. All that writing really only appears in the late 90s and early 2000s, and it's only, but I was thinking those things through and actualizing them as early as 1980, 81, 82, 83, in terms of performance work. 
And I didn't know it was going to be called performance studies, and I didn't know it would become a theoretical base, and I definitely didn't know that my son would be, coming, be doing a PhD in that field 30 years later, which is the reality of some of you know is my son Didi Morelli, a performance artist, is doing a PhD in performance studies. So at the time, I was just beginning to read the work of Richard Schechner and Victor Turner and those people who were instrumental in establishing performance studies as, as a base of theory and research. Mm -hmm. So those were the ideas of going across disciplines, going across spaces, and traveling geographically and traveling conceptually through time and space. Yeah. And in fact, that answer is a, a really great segue to one of the, I have three last questions. We'll see if we can get to all of them. Um, and it's, it's Didier in part and Diane as well. So through uh, Francois' exhibition at the Leonard and Bina Ellen Art Gallery, which was our the catalyst for our meeting. Um, I had, you know, I was working as a gallery attendant and I had many hours to be with Francois's show, which wasn't always a great thing in other shows to be with them for hours upon end, but Francois's show was wonderful. And the piece that really struck me in that exhibition was called L'Escadron. And a, a version of some of that work is actually in the normal setup of this show from that series. And L'Escadron was five children's high chairs, each with a metal structure placed inside the seat that spread out into this wingspan. But it was a metal um, framework. There was nothing light or wing-like about these wings. So each chair really had the look of actually being weighted down very decisively. But there was also something very much of the child because each one was a child's chair. Now, in one of the sculptures, the wingspan had tipped over, and there was a heavy, looked dirty, soiled pillow on one of those kind of filigree, very fine, but heavy wings. And I spent a lot of time looking at that piece and thinking about how hard it is to protect your child, if you are a parent, from life, from the heartbreak, from the pain, from the struggle of life. And I didn't know that Francois had a young son. But I feel that through that exhibition, I encountered you as a, as a sculptor particularly, but also as a parent. And this is a segue for me to, to ask you about some really profound relationships in your life. I'm not asking about relational art here, but relationships between your partner, Diane Chabonneau, and your son, Didier Morelli. I know these have been creative, profoundly collaborative relationships. I was wondering if you could speak about those. Yeah, that show at the Ellen Gallery uh, was a very uh, family autobiographical show because the back room had a wall and it had a basically timelines that mapped out grandparents to the most recent child who was Didier and the iconography in it was these were these winged figures that were uh, on high chairs and they were actually the pillows also of my parents that had passed away and basically I was not only dealing with my son's uh, turbulent uh, childhood at that point he would have been five years old no he would have been six or seven years old turbulent in the sense that he's just a kid and wanting to do stuff but it was also the passing of my parents who had passed away in the last three years and my father-in-law so it was a very charged show uh, and trying to deal with the notion of sentiment and sentimentality which were the two great taboos of modernity in terms of things not to weigh into so um, yeah I've been basically blessed to have a partner who's been not only supportive but collaborative in my practice. Um, she is, as some of you know, uh, a curator, curator of decorative arts and design and photography at the Musée des Beaux-Arts de Montréal, Diane Charbonneau. We've known each other for over 50 years. And um, we had a son, we have a son who's uh, 29 years old and who is uh, finishing his PhD and is a performance artist. And that in itself would mean how do you negotiate that? And um, it has been about understanding the three of our lives as interconnected projects that work off of each other and together. So uh, earlier on, I was doing an interview with a friend of my son's who's writing an essay, uh, an article on it, and I thought, how did it feel for him to have a father who was so well-known in the Montreal art community growing up? 
but he also had a mother who he would watch on TV or see in the newspaper growing up. And it would, but this was not popular culture. This was a very pointed point of fine arts. And he really didn't want to have anything to do with it, but at the same time, he was pretty much in awe, and he hung out with us, and he did those things. But equally, when we weren't in our own limelight of an opening or a show, we were on soccer fields, or we were at rehearsals for theater, or we were at dance classes, or we were in track and field meets. And those things sort of grew together. And I think everything changed when he did his first performance inadvertently. So if the first performance was my dad with a bag on his head, the, first perform the second performance for me was when Didier did a reenactment of a William Popel performance, which was The Crawl. And he basically, in his MF, MA at University of Toronto in a performance studies and master's degree, decided to crawl to the lecture room to deliver his paper on William, who he had met as a child because William and I did our master's degrees together in New York. And halfway through the crawl, he broke down and realized that this was extremely powerful as an act more powerful than having played Lear at the age of 11 years old or having done uh, vaudeville or anything or even won soccer games and this was very moving for him to do and he went on to do more performances. To see that realization in him, to see him, to look at the photographs downstairs of him operating a canner while I'm doing American Can in 2001 in a bathtub naked filled with tomato juice making soup in response to the, second, the first invasion of the Iraq war of George Bush in Montreal and CDN making the can and him putting labels on it. Uh, for me, it's, uh, as I said then, a PME. It's a small business operation. It's sort of a small business operation the same way as the small business operations counter multinationals. But they have global impact and their aspirations are global in terms of seeing how far they can go and where they can interact with. So it's been a real privileged opportunity to be able to, to, to have the dialogue and to have the conversations and to read his thesis on uh, public spaces and performance art and the relationship of architecture and normalization of architecture in the 80s and 90s in New York and Los Angeles. And him talking about all those artists who are my peers and seeing him articulate theory around that and to have his mother being his first editor and last editor of that in terms of the theory that's going on through that. And you have a show coming up. Yeah, and we collaborate. <laughs> but for me, the real gift was this show, because the day before this show, I opened Viva with a 13-hour endurance performance in Montreal. And he closed Viva with the performance three days later at the Viva Festival. And the curators, they know now, and people know we're connected because we carry the same names, but it's a great opportunity. And we kid each other because I got the invitation a month after he got the invitation. Of course, he says they had to invite you because they invited me. So now you get invited just as a kind of token. And now, basically, I've just been invited to perform at 7-Eleven-D in Toronto, and I told him that yesterday. And he said, of course, I performed there three years ago, and they're really happy to have you now because it's there. <laughs> so it's this ongoing dialogue of these two performance artists who happen to be 30 years apart. But again, we both acknowledge that that first performance was that senior man who put the bag, paper bag over his head and did that. So I want to ask you, since there's so much uh, in the way of drawing in this show, I have a question for you about drawing. Uh, when we spoke a few weeks ago, you told me that for you, drawings are an uncensored place. And when I first walked around this exhibition, I wrote uh, several words in my journal, and they were encounter, chimera, the flower, and great love. I find in your drawing, despite the fact that you have many, many interests, some explicitly political, some very much about embodiment, some very tied to what I would, you know, as an art, historical, art historian call art historical questions, there's still a great space in these drawings for tenderness, for hybridity, and uh, passion and compassion. And I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about your drawings as uncensored spaces. 
Yeah, I'm going to begin by uh, thanking Isabelle de Mévius for that because she is the owner of this space and she came to my studio and I showed her around my studio and she looked at the wire sculptures and she looked at the performance work and she thought everything around it. But when I started opening up drawers and she realized the quantity of drawings and the type of drawings that were there and the books and the commitment over the years, she basically said by the second meeting, that's the show I want to do. I want to curate a drawing show of yours. And I probably would not have done, given the freedom, a drawing show in this space. So she really did that. And secondly, her interests in drawing were further developed around her interest in Lacanian psychoanalysis. And she kept on thinking about that in relationship to the work that she saw in there. And I said to her by the first meeting, she said, so what are your interests in topologies and toponymies? And I went, okay, I could see it coming because I had been forewarned and I skirted the issue. And by the second time she said, well, are you interested in psychoanalysis and have you gone through analysis? And I said, no, but ever since I started drawing 40 years ago, people have wanted to analyze me because I tra basically try and not censor my work. And I try and work from a premise of stream of consciousness and a kind of automatism in terms of the drawing. And she said, well, you don't have to do an analysis, you do this, meaning the work that was in the studio. So yeah, the drawing was the first gesture, it was the first book, and literally the drawing in a book. There were no artworks in our family, there were no artworks in the house, there was very little music, we were really a very conservative Italian family. But with the brother that I had, who was like the second father that I had, drawings started to appear in the household because he was doing a degree at Sir George William at the time. And they were the drawings of the community around Lee Plotek and those people who were now my colleagues and they were his friends, poets and writers. And I started seeing drawings and I first bought a sketchbook and started drawing in sketchbooks. And those are the, th the places that I've kept protected for 45 years now, before I went to school. And now they take this scale and throughout that, I've been able to do the conceptual, the political, the social, and the engagement, and I continue to claim them as the real part of me. But that honest, very direct, straightforward, simple kind of drawing of a pencil and a sketchbook and a place to focus and go there is still where I go to regularly. And there is that honesty and intimacy and stripped nature of that space. And that brings me back to those first loves of drawing that I was doing when it was that, where are the William, ba William Blake illustrations that he brought home or the Gustave Doré drawings that he brought home or the, the works that were of the late 19th and early 20th century in terms of symbolism drawing and that love for the ornamental for the for for the elegance of those drawings but also of the perverse and the twisted and the areas around that work that was being celebrated around Felicien Rops and Jay Mensor who were Belge who came from Belgium the same place as Isabelle de Bivieux so when I inaugurated the show I talked about that when I came in so read the for the words in order again and I'll respond to them encounter the meeting of myself and the other on the street I've already talked about, but the meeting of myself and myself on a page of paper. Chimera. Hybridity, distressing hybridity in the distressing times coming from an interest in mythology and mythologies that I studied at the Metropolitan throughout the history and the mythology that taught to, told me about different points in history where crises were occurring in different histories and the scariness of that hybridity and these times where hybridity has become the norm. The flower. Wanting to draw flowers and paint flowers for a longest time and really realizing that it was the ultimate transgression as a modernist painter and artist and then going to the first Japanese festivals of cherry blossoms in Newark, New Jersey in the early 80s and then in the mid 80s with Didi and Diane and seeing these cherry blossoms and beginning to draw cherry blossom trees on American dollar bills trying to make a hundred miniature trees using George Washington head and then starting to draw flowers and then realizing they were poppies or, or were they poppies and then entering the full-fledged world of the ornament and the decorative. The great love. It's a hard one because I just told you already, this woman who I live with, I've known for 50 years. And when you said that, I couldn't really figure out how to respond because I've been set up on this thing and she allowed me to know what the words would be. So I went on internet and I went to Wikipedia 
And I went to a great love. I went to a love supreme. I went to John Coltrane. So McCoy Tyner, who's John Coltrane's piano player, recounts, he told me, he says, I respond to what's around me, remembers Tyner. That's the way it should be, you know. And it was, I couldn't wait to get to work at night. It was just such a wonderful experience. I mean, I didn't know what we were going to do. We couldn't really explain why things came together so well, you know, and why it was, you know, meant to be. I mean, it's hard to explain things like that. And I think it's really what Coltrane discovers at a certain point beyond the spirituality, but he is in the spirituality. It's that notion of improvisation and the idea of improvisation connecting into that sense of, li of liveliness in the here and now and the connectedness to that moment and to the people around you. So that love of that life force. So the very last thing I wanted to ask you about, but I don't really think we have much time for it, is something you said. This is a question for the students in the room. Uh, you told me uh, about your own experience as a young artist, and you said something that really uh, wowed me. You said, the most powerful things thing I could get my hands on as a young person was art. It was a way of living my life that offered the most freedom and possibility. And today, I think a lot of young people who choose to study art are doing so oppositionally. They're doing it without the support of their parents. And I'm sure the same was same for you. But you spoke about it as freedom, possibility, and power. And I'm wondering how that view of art has shaped in the way you're teaching. Well, now I've also would add the word privilege to that because I've understood it as being a great privilege to have been able to discover it and to exercise it as a teacher and to be able to now command spaces like this here and do that. Coming from a very modest background and coming as the sense of being reminded of, the, our, of our past in terms of immigration and our, our integration into North American culture and into a very complex identity politics of Quebec and Canada, um, the idea of wanting to move beyond that Hochelaga Maisonneuve and to get out of what clearly had been defined as a ghetto by family and by friends and uh, understanding what the potential of a worldview was as early as 16 years old in 1967 through Expo. As stupid as that might sound, it was a worldview. And one thing, how do I access that? And then realizing that the education had brought me to be either a doctor, an engineer, or a lawyer through my high school. And the moment I made, began to make art, I realized that the potential was there to both enjoy, pleasurably make, and travel with it. And that that would also give me a key to working. And it proved to be my ticket into the US legally for 10 years where I was an adjunct teacher teaching. And it's proved to be an opportunity for me to travel internationally all these years around the world, literally in the pretext of doing mobile nomadic work and dealing with other cultures and other people. So yes, it's been a truly empowering relationship. And if anything, I do feel that when I work and teach, the prime message is that one of agency, one of agency and one of empowerment in relationship to making, and one in agency and empowerment in terms of both in terms of reciprocity with other in terms of reception. And recently, over the last five years, a really re-understanding materiality through one of live agency in materiality mm -hmm. and in spaces and places as live entities that can be worked with and worked through as opposed to just process-oriented materials of the 60s and 70s that I had grown up with. So these were key lessons in relationship to the politics of making and the politics of teaching and the politics of experience that I was struggling to learn from in the early 60s through the politics of engagement locally through a social project of Quebec and internationally through a kind of counterculture that was hoping to change the world. I 
think that's the right place to end and to now take some time with uh, your questions or comments if you have them. I think Francois, Francois, I can tell you that when we had a, a pre a pre-conversation in anticipation of this conversation, we talked for three hours. So <laughs> I can assure you that he's not tired yet. <laughs> so are there any questions from the audience? Curiosity, technical. I came at the opening and there were too many people. I could not appreciate. What are we missing here? So for? the piece we're missing right in the center, and, and thank you, Pierre Francois, for pointing it out because it's the meeting point between Cynthia and I. It's squadron. So there, there are five iron high chairs that literally go here and turn the corner with one that has a pillow that tips it over. And the objects are toy chairs. They correspond to the age that the, the 19, six, 1996 I made them. They come right after Les Lames that I showed at uh, the Musée d'Art Contemporain, which is now a musée, at Musée du Québec, which was the bed with pillows. And it's my pillow that's tipping over the, fifth, the fourth chair that turns the corner like a gravity pull down. And it's my pillow because basically one day I was changing, we were f making the bed, my wife and I, and said that pillow is really disgusting because I had not changed pillows, I think, for 30 years. And all those stains were there. And I never thought that you changed pillows. I thought you kept your pillow. I mean, if anything, you know. Talk about <laughs> transference and Lacan, right? Let's go there. So um, I said, okay, I've got, a piece for, I've got a place for it. And I put it there as the counterweight to that. So that's the piece that's here. And just quickly, in a sense, the work in the show is really using the three sculptural bodies of work that are the wire work that I've been doing since 1995, 85, the belt heads, which I began in 96, and the strapping pieces next door, which are 90s and 80s work, has ways of anchoring the selection of drawings to show that they don't necessarily come before or after, but they're in dialogue with the two-dimensional graphic work that's there. Um, when, I'm, when I look at your drawings, and I'm familiar with your work for some time now, I, I see a new element in, in these particular large pieces, the stains, uh, you, know, that, that, you know, the blemishes, the, the marks. And they seem to, for me, as, you know, um, when I look at drawing, I think about it in this way that there's a, a sense of projection um, onto the surface, um, your ideas, your concerns, your concepts, I'll let you speak about. But the stains, for me, represent something else. In other words, it's a sense of genesis that is not your projection, per se, but they seem to be growing out of the surface. They seem to kind of be something that you would have to kind of engage in. Now, when I say this about projection and, uh, say, genesis or, 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 or growth, I think about the, um, the uh, performance you did on Oshelaga where you went and you measured, uh, you know, uh, you know with, your, with the art stick from, from one corner to another corner. And, and there, again, you're, 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 you're doing something. You're projecting, you're, 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 you're putting forward. And I would imagine that the, the genesis, the part that is not controlled, is the encounter with the individuals, uh, people that you meet and the story that they're going to tell. Uh, so all of this to say, do you, do you see a connection between what you were doing there, drawing on the ground, surveying, uh, in terms of acting as a cartographer uh, in a certain way, and then working with your drawings in this way where now there's a duality in a certain way? Thanks. Um, yeah, for someone, for, my biggest fear is to think of being uh, inconsistent in breakage and to be able to link La Mesure with these drawings and the notion of stain and explosion of stain and the moment of encounter and to see them as continuous or contingent in a way is really wonderful for me to be. Yeah, I think they are aligned and they are the unpredictable and they go to what I said at the end earlier that the notion of agency is not only in that individual telling me his or her story and sharing that moment together, but it is also the agency of these materials. I grew up to understand these materials within a surrealist tradition of being inert and, in, and just to work with and of the expressionist tradition of you do things to the surface. You, you, you are, in a sense, acting with materials that you command and do. 
And in the last couple of years, especially through this course with Cynthia, and the notion of the performative has come in. I understand now materials largely out of their performative, but also material liveliness. And they are acting on the surface with me. And we are working through and together. And that has been made possible, th the fact that they exist first and foremost horizontally on the floor. They exist on the floor horizontally, and then I pour onto them, and then I bring them up, and then I engage with them on the wall. And anyone who's done the workshops with me understands this relationship between the floor and the wall and the verticality of my body when I'm walking on them or when I'm crawling on them. So when I'm on the street, I am also crawling and on a horizontal relationship, and the person talking is often vertical standing there, so the power relationships that are there. So yes, they are, in the sense, the becoming and the notion of becoming, and the notion of potentiality, and the notions of those things that are unpredictable, and the idea of faith in the fact that they will turn out whatever way they have to turn out. And the notion of failure is not even part of the register. They're just about an, an acknowledgement of the happening of them becoming, and that's about it. That's all I can expect for them. And these are particularly more so. The drawings on the top were about those stains, but they are on a, in a book on a table, and they, they're back to 89, and they were a table where, match, where, where I'm really controlling the surface more. But these were literally on the floor of the studio space, and they took my entire studio space, and there was something very liberating about being able to do that. Their fluidity, their stain quality, and their kind of emerging out or exploding. There was somebody else behind there, I think. I think you, did you have a question? There. Over there. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you said that you have an upcoming performance, and I was just wondering if you could speak a bit about what that might entail. Just curious. I just finished a performance. That's what I just finished, which was, and I, and I can give you in a nutshell what that was, because I think it's an important performance. Uh, what I did, because I think it is part of this show, because it happened just the night of this op the night before the opening. Uh, when you see the film, if you ever do, the last scene is a performance I did in Ali Bag, where I basically mimic a, sn a snail. A snail drew a circle, and I made a small video of it, and it blew me away. And the next day, I went back to that site, and I put a spoon in my mouth, and I lay on the ground, and I crawled for an hour, and made a 20-foot diameter circle by digging in the sand and creating a circular line. That same day before and the day after, I also encountered sandals that had been beached. Uh, they basically in India are wearing a lot of flip-flops and, 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 and light footwear that at the beach ends up going off into the ocean and coming back and going back out in the ocean. And I collected 158 sandals in the space of two hours, put them in a bag, brought them back to the studio, sanded, cleaned them up, got them shipped to Canada, and they arrived. And I've been sitting on them for three, two years now, not knowing what to do with them. Um, I wanted to perform in Mumbai with them, bringing them through the streets of Mumbai and basically address people in their relationship to footwear and to the imprint of the foot and the importance of the foot in Hindu belief systems and in, in, the, in, 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 in India. But I couldn't be sure that I would be able to communicate with people who only spoke Hindi or Arabic, and I didn't want to do that. So I waited till I came back, and I thought something would come up. And I took this opportunity in this one, which was the 375th anniversary of Montreal, to map out a history of Montreal, starting with the, cha the fountain of Paul de Chamédi de Maisonneuve in front of Notre Dame with the rising sun of October 5th of this year. I went there with the duffel bag filled with the sandals. I laid them out. I started performing with them, went to the fountain, and then realized that, the, and I didn't know ahead of time, wrote the word genocide with the sandals in front of Notre Dame, and then put them back in the bag and went to Marguerite Bourgeois' fountain, which is right next door, and there cleaned them with a brush and, took, and washed them in the fountain. And then I went to the next fountain, which was Vauclin, which is next to City Hall, and that was the first prison where people were executed or put out on display. And there I performed with a blindfold. And then I went to Jean-Paul Riopelle's fountain, which was the epic figure of my childhood as the great abstract expressionist male figure. 
And there I basically went into the fountain and threw the sandals up in the air and let them float and put a blindfold and laid them out around the thing and made it to Victoria and ended with Giovanni Cabotto, who was the Italian who came here and supposedly discovered America. And when anyone asked me what I was doing, I told them I was basically walking around trying to relate to all those white conquerors who came looking for India and called anyone other Indian and in the process denied the other as being who they were in the process of trying to find out who they were. And that was, it took 13 hours to get to, back to Viva and that was the opening of Viva and the festival started. So that was the last performance I've done. Now I've got to figure out the next one which is for 7-11-D and I don't know what I'm going to do for that. That's next year. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really enjoying the uh, morphing and the uncanniness in these drawings, and I think you mentioned in passing that we live in a world where hybridity is the norm. Could you describe a little bit more what you meant by that? When Cynthia warned me that chimera would be one of the words, I went to the, uh, the dictionary, the online dictionary, and realized that within Chimera we went from mythologies of where it appeared and that idea of hybridity of the winged uh, goat figure with serpent tail and female head was part of what was going on and bird head. But then I got to Chimera as a medical biological situation where the hybrid cellular level and biology of multiple cells being brought together to create a new entity. And then I got into popular culture and I realized that basically implants, uh, manipulation of the DNA, um, a lot of what we live with and understand now, whether through cosmetic surgery, permanent or not, uh, within our lifestyles and within our identity, our negotiation of identity and transformation of identity, this idea of hybridity has really become a way of understanding who we can be or what we can do with each other. And in the end, I went back to that first definition, which is when the chimera appears, usually it's a period of struggle and strife and danger at moments of crisis in civilizations. And I thought, well, chimera has been around for a while, and I, I was attracted to it probably when I was starting to draw red and black figure vases at the Met in the early 80s, which is what I was doing a lot, and trying to engage with mythologies and my own mythologies as a Westerner, but other mythologies. But I think we live out those mythologies now as individuals, and I think that a lot of the potential of science and the Borg and things of that nature were important. And if I had one very important professor who taught me, it was Leon Golub, and his relationship to uh, the, the, the uh, monster and that hybrid monster that he worked with, and his fascination with science fiction and the Borg really blew me away as a young student. I was like, why is this political animal who was working around mercenaries and who's so involved with labor interested in Borgs? Why is he so interested in science fiction? And I really didn't understand, and I'm getting a better idea of it now when I, as I get closer to his age when I studied with him. And and then and, and I look at his later work and I understand that. So I think as a society, that idea of the hybrid and the idea of the mutant is really something that is, doesn't surprise anymore. It really is something that we accept and understand more and more in our society. On the other hand, we also look at the strain of purity and the idea of the fallacy of that idea of purity in, in, in strains of ethnicity and race and things like that. So I'm not saying they're gone, but for me as an artist, I was attracted to the hybrid. I was attracted to the monstrosity of the hybrid uh, and of the power that was in that figure, whether it was in Hittite reliefs where I saw them at the Met, these wonderful large low relief carvings of winged figures and winged lionesses. They were super powerful. And they also coincided with my interest in the hermaphrodite, which I was picking up from movie culture. Fellini's hermaphrodite really always stayed with me all my life. So those were interesting things. So that ambiguity of gender also and that ambiguity of the hybrid there is interesting. So I don't know if they're the norm, but they really are very pervasive and very present in our society and our imagination today.
Hi. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak about teaching and maybe about how that has maybe nurtured or changed your personal practice. Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, I, I, I was interested in teaching, and I would say I came from a, a, a very, even before art ever became part of our, my ambitions as, as a young man, uh, my older cousins, and there's something strange about second generation Italian immigrants post-war, where teaching was a noble job. To become a grade school teacher, to go to teaching college was something that you aspired to. I had cousins who did it, and it was something that we did, and we, that there was part of what, the edu what, what a first generation or a second generation of immigrants could do. So already it was there. I come from also a family where uh, the mat matriarch was super powerful, and the mother was a very gen generous and nurturing figure in terms of teaching. She ended up being able to channel that as a teacher of young women at Eaton's in the telephone operating room in terms of working with young women and training them because they, they recognized she had a gift to, to give and to nurture. And that man who was so instrumental and important in my life, who was my brother, who was the ultimate beat, hippie, radical of the 60s, did it for four years and turned around and became a grade school teacher and devoted himself to 30 years of teaching children because he felt that that was the most important place to be. So teaching was always important. That idea of transmission and the idea of knowledge and the idea of, of community was super important. By the time I become an artist, I realized that this is not going to be a, a stretch. I'm not compromising anything. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not having a problem wanting to be a teacher. But I am confronted with that god-awful stereotype that you can't be a good artist and a good teacher, which is what the pervasive adage was. If you were one or the other, but you couldn't do both. And it was hard to figure it out because in the end, a lot of the teachers I had weren't great, unfortunately. And I was maybe seeing the proof of that in the pudding sometimes. But by the time I finished my career and I went to the US, I did find some amazingly committed and good teachers here and there. And when I began to teach, not only did it become my ticket into the US, because I was basically a migrant cheap laborer. There's no union in terms of labor, in terms of adjunct teaching. You know, there's no kupfa in American at Rutgers University. So, but it did give me that visa to cross the border every time I crossed for nine years. So it was my ticket to be able to do it. And it gave me the opportunity of working with students and working with people in various fields. By the time I came back and I got my first tenure track teaching job, people were going, my God, you're going to teach at trois Rivières after Manhattan? How are you going to pull that off? And people didn't realize it was still the blue collar in me that was going, tenure track, pension, Life, come on, this is like, get with it. This is like what every artist I had met in New York wanted, and that's what we aspired to, because really, you know, the 80s in New York, even within the glut of the new marketplace, made me realize that all the people that I worked with who were the stars of the time, Golub at his retirement thanked Rutgers University. He didn't thank his dealer. He thanked Rutgers University for paying the bills for 20 years and supporting him and Nancy Spiro and his four children. Uh, Martha Rossler taught. These were the people who now I understand as the superstars of that beginning art market. They were all teachers, and they committed themselves to doing that. And then the artists I knew basically all taught. Now, the pragmatic side of that is I like teaching. I really do like working with people. And I was able to be able to uh, move across disciplines because I literally have taught in every department of studio arts. And I've worked with individuals, and for me, that magical moment that I experienced as a young CGEP student, I remember the first time I had my first crit. It was coming out of a high school in the East End, and I really had no knowledge of an art class. The closest I got to art was Learn to Draw by John Nagy on TV. It was a TV show that I watched. But I got my first crit, and the teacher said, what you're doing in that book is really amazing and interesting. And then I started getting that support, and I started getting that ener energy, and I started finding the magic of making and the kind of potential that's there. And honestly, I still see that every time I teach, and I can see the light go up, come up. People who just tweak and just go there. And that generosity that's possible in terms of giving and what you get back from it. So it's been a real opportunity to be able to work with people who are always young, who are always changing, and who mark their time, who give me a real sense of what's happening in terms of culture, popular culture, day-to-day -day culture, and the issues that are there while I'm also working through. 
So the ideas go through, the practices go through, and I can work with people and go there. And there's, it's about as intimate a relationship as you can get. And, and that's where it really becomes iffy in terms of the true politics of teaching in terms of what is really at stake when you're alone with an individual who's super vulnerable in terms of what they're doing in their life, expression, and subconscious. And that is an amazing privilege to have, but it's also a supercharged moment to be working with. So to have that privilege and able to go there and work where it goes, and the dividends of when that works out are amazing for the person who's teaching because those people have come back for years and in the moment, with the gratitude, but with their work moving forward. So it's a privilege. It's a privilege that has paid the bills, that has allowed for all the things to do, and has also allowed me to do the work that I want to do. Because, yeah, this show right now could be seen as a very commercial, successful work show if we had a marketplace that was willing to go there. But the truth of the matter, the 80s, I was walking around with sculptures on my back. I was making as provocative work as I could. And when that lady downstairs wants to buy the sculpture in Nice, and I ask her why, and she says, because it's the god-awful, ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life, and I want to buy it to take it off the streets, she was basically doing exactly, telling me exactly what I was going for and the interest that I was interested in. So I didn't want to have to really work with that idea of having to earn a living from my making although it's possible, and I do respect people who can do it. And I think I should have been able to do it throughout it, but that's another story. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe one more? One more, if there is one more. One more? Yeah. Hi. Do you see yourself primarily as a researcher or, quote, unquote, a traditional artist? <gasps> i.e., do you create work to explain your research, or do you create research to explain your work? It's, a, it's an interesting, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double talk that one, which I often do. I first encountered the word research when I looked at what a full professor's workload looked like. In other words, when I arrived in Trois-Rivières, and I saw what a full professor, it was basically pedagogy, recherche, service. And then when I got to Concordia, it was the same thing. Research, teaching, and service. And I was made for a university culture of whether you were in the sciences, in the literature, or whatnot. The research part is what you did as an academic. And that starts for me in 1991. By 1997, 98, 99, the rumblings of research creation is starting to happen on the horizon. And I become one of the biggest advocates for it because I feel that it is high time that the artist in the institution finally gets to see his practice recognized on the same level as other researchers within the academic environment. Because when I had been hired in Trois-Rivières and I met my first dean in Trois-Rivières and I shook hands with him at, at the meeting at our first party and I was introduced as the new professor in studio arts and he said, what do you do? I said, I make sculptures and drawings. He says, oh, talk to my wife. She's the one who goes to shows. <laughs> and I was very irate and I was like, what do you do? Are you an engineer? Are you a scientist? And I wanted... So research creation made me feel like, okay, here we go. This is, for once, the recognition that a practicing artist, that the people who had taught me, Guido Molinari, Irene Watton, were doing research. But they were calling it making art. They didn't go to the lab, they went to their studios. And they did what they did. And believe me, when we created Hexagram, it was largely on the reputation of those Prix Bourdieu's and Governor General's awards of those artists who had done paintings and drawings and sculptures and legitimized studio arts as an active research endeavor. Now we are 10 or 12 years later within the auspices of research creation. And that's where I begin to double talk because I have a son who's doing a PhD who basically is writing a thesis which is all around this notion of research and creation and making. As for me, I've always felt that my practice was experimental and that I am always engaging with newness and invention 
and pushing the limits of where I'm at in terms of where I want to get to. That I work within a historical paradigm that goes back to makers and image makers and object makers that go back to the history of us as a species. And that in the most dire situations that we have existed, we have made images and objects to contend with situations of oppression and alienation and existence in the face of the wonder and mystery and angst of living, we make and we celebrate or we contest and we challenge. Is that research? I don't know. But I, that's what I do. Can, articul can I articulate it? I hope I've proven in the last hour that I can. Is it, do I have, do, have, I, have I, can I go beyond that? I don't know. Am I interested in theory? Yes. Do I use theory? Yes. Am I interested in what someone who explores theory in a different way and writes about my work? I'm indebted to it. Cynthia, Bernard Lamarche, other, other critics, people in the humanities, people in the sciences who will shed a new lens on my work, who will inform it through biology, through other fields, yes. So if I can talk about agency and new materiality, it's because someone like Barad who will write around that in theory. And I am interested in that because I can actually have a new way of understanding what I've been doing. But it's the same lens as when Madame de Mévius talks to me about Lacan. And I just go there and I wonder what is that and where do I go with that? These are lenses and opportunities to go. And sometimes you have cultures and academias who shoo, shoo, shoo or poo, poo, psychoanalysis in different ways. So for me, what's the essence is to protect that studio space of making. And I tell my, studios, my students of studio art that we're making, and we, when we're making, we're making, and the moment you stand up and start talking about what you've just made, you're making theory, even if it's just descriptive, because you're articulated in words. And as you go on with this, you will articulate it differently. And yes, I am glad that there are places for studio arts people to go on to PhDs and make and theorize. Because I've got one who is my son who is doing exactly that, and I encounter others who are doing that. And I think, honestly, if I was 25 years old and an artist today, I'd be working towards a PhD. Because I have that makeup of curiosity and interest in ideas and in language and in engagement. But it's not given to every artist. But I do have that, and I have fit and worked within the institution. And I am interested in funding institutions in terms of making sure that there is equity within that distribution of wealth that is a democratic gaining of things. And that's where research creation anchors itself for its legitimacy. And that's where really the politics play. So it's not really important until we get to the politics of that and see how it's played out. And ultimately, it's the good art that I'm interested in, the art that will work and that will be expressing what it needs to express. I think perhaps on that note, I'm going to invite you all to uh, enjoy the good art. <laughs> <laughs> That's that a horrible <laughs> way of ending it. <laughs> <laughs> if I may make that judgment that is so richly on display in this exhibition. And please also to join me in thanking Francois Morelli for this wonderful talk. <laughs>